Good morning. Now you can tell Jason's back because we're actually starting on time today, if you look at that. All right, First Peter chapter 2. Um, we're going to backtrack just a, a few verses, but we're going to finish up chapter 2 today. Um, and so let's read chapter 2, verses 21 through the end of the chapter, uh, and then pray, and then we'll, we'll consider that. So First Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. So let's pray and then let's consider this, uh, this section of scripture uh, from Peter and the Holy Spirit. Father, again, we thank you that we have the opportunity to, to look at your word. I pray today that as we as we open this up, that it will be meaningful, it will be edifying, it will uh, just let us know more and more about you and give us, uh, and just set our love on you more and more for what you have done and what you are doing. So Lord, today as, we, uh, as I speak, may I speak clearly, may I certainly not misrepresent any of the words here, uh, and that you would just guide me in all truth. Uh, and I ask this in your son's name, amen. All right, so a brief recap of uh, uh, 1 Peter, as we've been uh, talking about for the last several weeks. Uh, it's a letter written to those uh, exiles, those elect exiles. They're in a hostile land, but they are Christians, and they're there because of their persecution and are being persecuted. So they are aliens. They live in this land, but they're not citizens of that land. And it's just uh, certainly perfectly analogous to, to Christians today. We are... We live in this world, but we're not citizens of this world, okay? We are citizens of heaven. So, so everything Peter tells the first century Christians of these exiles certainly applies to us in the world we live in today. And so he does that by reminding them who they are, that they're chosen, chosen by God. They're, they're his own possession. They're his. It was nothing they did. And, but they're going to undergo some uh, trials, and, and this will test the genuineness of their faith. Uh, certainly that is the, the purpose of all trials of Christians, is to test the genuineness of your faith and to bring you closer to Christ, to draw you to him. And then he, he, he tells them, though, that as, these, as you are in this pagan land, as you are in this uh, alien land, you are to conduct yourself to reflect Jesus. Uh, and then he goes on to describe several situations, your daily conduct, whether it be obeying the government, um, obeying, uh, if you're a slave, you obey your master, if you're an employee, you, you, uh, you obey your employer. Uh, that is all part of what God calls us to do because that reflects Jesus and what he tells us to do. Uh, but he also says you're going to conduct, you're going to undergo duress, you're going to go um, uh, persecution and uh, and how you conduct yourself during that persecution also is a reflection directly on our Lord and so that's what he's going to talk about today in this section uh, and that conduct that that we demonstrate while we're uh, undergoing unjust suffering that conduct that we demonstrate is evangelistic it, it, it demonstrates uh, the witness of Jesus Christ uh, in your environment, where you are, and you undergo that. As he said earlier in uh, verse 12 there, uh, Peter says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles. And now Gentiles here is referring to all those outside the church, unbelievers. So keep your con conduct among them honorable. Honorable meaning honoring God. Okay, should reflect that. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So your, 
your conduct among outsiders. Just your conduct, not even your word, will reflect God. It may be the means by which God draws an unbeliever to himself. So your conduct is important. In verse 15, he also says your conduct does this. It says, this is for the will of God that by doing good, that's your conduct doing good, you should put to silence uh, the ignorance of foolish people. Again, we spoke the ignorance is speaking of the spiritual ignorance that unbelievers are still in. Uh, a place where we all once were before God regenerated us. And in verse 19, when you undergo this unjust suffering, when you're persecuted for, uh, for him, he says, this is a gracious thing. Uh, then when mindful of God, one endures the sorrows while suffering unjustly. Now again, this is, uh, this is God's grace that when you are persecuted or suffering unjustly, uh, that you endure it. That is a grace of God that he gets you through that. And he, and he makes the contrast that when you on the other hand, when you sin and you're suffering, okay, what good is that? That's, that's chastening. That's God just chastening you. So this is talking about when we're unjustly persecuted for the Lord. And so our, our conduct sets an example to the world. I mean, I think we all know that. The people, the world, like Ray talked about last time, the world is looking at you. And the example you set is going to be good or bad. Uh, the world is looking to to make something out of nothing to you even when you're doing good but if they look at your deeds you know that may be the uh, method by which God has joined them but but the world is after you the, you know the Satan's roaring around or prowling around like a lion looking for someone to devour they're looking for something in Christian so our conduct sets an example now prior to our becoming Christians prior to our regeneration we were the world we were spiritually ignorant. We wanted the things of the world. That's how we were. Okay? And, and Paul says it in, in Titus 3, he, he talks about himself uh, as, with, as a, even the other apostles. He says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient. We led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. And Paul is describing himself there. And then he gives us that list in 1 Corinthians 6 of, um, uh, as he's speaking to the Corinthian church, telling them uh, about the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he lists those things there, um, the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he puts it, drives it home, and such were some of you. And probably all of us will fit on that list in some form or fashion of those before we were uh, regenerated. But you, us, those that are regenerated, were washed. That means you were, you were clean. You were unclean, now you're, you're clean in the eyes of God. Uh, you were sanctified, which means you're being made more and more into that image of Christ. And you were justified. Now we stand justified before a holy God, uh, not on any of our own righteousness, but because of that righteousness that washed us clean that Jesus uh, gave to us. Um, but then after regeneration, after we're saved, um, we still live in the world. We're still in the same place we were before, right? And we still probably have the same friends that we had before, maybe even hanging around with them like, like we did before. But Peter tells us this in, in, the, in chapter 4. He says, Now, for the, time is the t for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. So now that you're a, a Christian, the time is past for what you did when you were an unbeliever. And the, 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 the past, it suffices. It's sufficient. You're done. You don't have to do it anymore. As a matter of fact, you don't do it anymore. He says, For the time is past that suffices for doing what the Gentiles do. And he Gives a couple examples, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. So that is all past. That's what, that was in our pre-regeneration days, or unregenerate days. Um, but then what happens? He goes, with respect to this, now your friends, they're surprised when you do not join them. 
So all of a sudden, you're a different creature. You're a new creation, right? You don't, you don't do the things you did before. And so how do they act? They malign you. Okay? They talk bad about you. That's the way it works. Uh, they stay unregenerate. You regenerate. Your, your circle of friends changes. Um, that's what they do. And they malign you because they're still part of the world. So they're, they're going to uh, gonna persecute you for, uh, for your new life. So, as, as a professing believer, um, our conduct should be exemplary and it should, be, it should mark Jesus. It should, exa- it should give the example of Jesus to a lost world. Uh, because Satan, they're looking, they're looking for things for you, as, as Ray talked about last week. That, that is the spiritual warfare that we're in in this world as uh, Christians in a fallen world. But being that example is difficult sometimes. Um, because we still got the remaining flesh, right? We, we, Paul said that quite well. Um, and that remaining flesh is we still have the desires of the flesh, the desires of the, the eyes and the pride of uh, life that, that John talks about in 1 John. But, but Paul, you know, mentioned that he, he, he has that same understanding of it that, you know, sometimes you want to do the things you want to do, but, but your flesh gets the better of you. Um, it's, a, it's a constant battle that we, that we go through in here. But the difference in being regenerated now is that flesh doesn't have dominance over you. Okay, now that you have been regenerated with the Holy Spirit, that Spirit empowers you that now you can fight the flesh. It's still there, but, it's, but <clears throat> we, we, we suppress it now because we have the ability to do that, whereas before we didn't. We wanted the things of the world. Like I said, we were... We were part of the world. We gladly joined into the things of the world. That's what we wanted to do. That was our desires. But now we've been washed. We've been saved. We've been justified. We've been changed. And our desires now are different. They're changed. So when we were unsaved, we were part of the world. Okay. But God, when he regenerated us, uh, he gave us the power to overcome that world. So our desires change. Uh, the power to overcome our sin has, uh, has been given to us by the Holy Spirit. And as we walk in this world, we must be the example of Jesus to a fallen world. Although our example, we're, we should be, or we're taught to be the example of Jesus to a fallen world. Our example is Jesus himself. Our pattern is Jesus himself. And Ray talked about that word pattern, how it means it's a perfect cutout. You know, it's a pattern that Jesus laid down that we are to follow. So Jesus is a perfect example, certainly in many ways. Um, You know, he to us, we we saw that he um, obeyed the father's will perfectly. Uh, That's what we should be striving to do. Uh, But as a. And his ministry on this earth, he was, he was one to emulate. He was compassionate. He was uh, merciful. He was selfless. He was, uh, he was the perfect man uh, as he walked this world. And even his teachings were so profound and insightful that even unbelievers will adopt some of those teachings in their, into their philosophy. So he was, he was a great example to the world, but... In this section here, Peter really has an eye on uh, him being our example in suffering, okay, in the way he suffered for us, in the way we should suffer, being an example to him. So um, he reminds them that, that, that Peter reminds the, uh, his initial audience and us that, that Christ's suffering purchased uh, their salvation by his blood. When it says there, because Christ also suffered for you, uh, leaving you an example. He suffered for you, and that way he purchased his blood. And so we will follow in his steps, is what he tells us to do. We should follow in his steps when we do suffer. But there's a difference, because Jesus suffered, um, his suffering, uh, and um, in his suffering, he purchase the salvation of others, right? When we suffer, we can't purchase anybody else's salvation, but it does prove our salvation when we endure suffering uh, as Jesus did. 
It proves our salvation, but it never has the effect that Jesus' suffering did because his suffering pointed to his cross and his substitutionary atonement. <clears throat> so we, uh, we demonstrate that faith through our suffering as we follow in his footsteps. And it says at the beginning of verse 21 there, we're called to follow in his steps. So we are... We are called that, and, this, and the suffering that he is, is now telling us that we must do, in verse 22, he, he now tells us a little bit more about the exemplary life and death of Jesus. Okay, In verse 22, he tells us that he, Jesus, committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. So Peter wanted his readers to understand how Jesus responded to the unjust suffering that was inflicted upon him. And if anyone suffered unjustly, it was Jesus. I mean, he was perfect, right? There was no, uh, uh, everything that he, uh, he was called a blasphemy when all he did was tell the truth. Uh, he was the son of God and, blas and uh, uh, was told that he, or was accused of being a blasphemer because of that. So in this, then, um, Peter just uh, references to Isaiah 53, which, as we know, is one of the, the great messianic psalms uh, or messianic passages in the Old Testament. And that, and let me just read it to you in 53.9, what Isaiah said. He says, although he had done no violence, speaking of the Messiah to come, Jesus, and there was no deceit in his mouth, that's the verse he's referring to here. So in Isaiah 53, he uses the word violence, although he'd done no violence. Well, we know that's not speaking of a physical act of violence, but it's really speaking of a, uh, a violence against God, a, a sin against God, something that's against his, uh, um, against his law. And in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament actually uses that word instead of violence. It uses the word lawlessness, which really is more the uh, sense of what Isaiah is saying, that that the Messiah will not sin and have no deceit in his mouth. Deceit in his mouth is, is interesting, too, and very uh, important because the easiest part of your anatomy to sin with is your mouth, your tongue, what you say. You know, you may not have the opportunity to physically uh, sin in a lot of things, but the mouth's always there, and it's always connected to your brain. And uh, sometimes we say things we shouldn't, so it's the easiest way. But your, your mouth and your words reflect what? Your heart. That's right. Out of your heart comes the words, right? And so that's what defiles you uh, when it comes out. So that's the easiest uh, way that we can sin. And Jesus, uh, Jesus then was sinless, okay? Sinless. In every respect, think about that, in a deed, he never committed a sinful deed, okay? With the Old Testament law focused on deeds and the external things, right? Well, he never uh, committed a, a sin in that way. He never committed a sin with his mouth. And as Jesus also told us, uh, he, he took that to another level because he said what, you know, uh, if you even look at a woman, uh, you've already committed adultery in your, in your heart. You know, if you're angry with someone, you've already committed murder. So it's your thoughts and your heart that are going to be judged as well. And Jesus was perfectly sinless because his heart was pure. Okay, so he never committed a sin uh, in thought, word, deed. So he was sinless. And he, yet he was, he was uh, I remember, he came to earth as a man. He was tempted in every way we were, yet without sin, as the author of Hebrews tells us. So then now, Jesus, uh, now Peter goes to Jesus' reaction to when he did suffer. Uh, in verse 23 there, it says, When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So Peter reminds us that even though Jesus was sinless, <clears throat> he was reviled. He was, uh, and his response to that unjust suffering that he and unjust treatment is our example. And again, he goes to Isaiah 53 because this is where uh, he gets this idea from. It says, Isaiah said in 53, verse 7 this time, it says, He, again speaking of the Messiah, was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. And like a lamb that's led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is before the shears of silence, so he opened not his mouth. So he, Jesus was 
reviled. He was repro reproached. He was falsely accused. He was um, insulted. Um, so what do we do when we're insulted and we're falsely accused and reviled? What's our typical response? Yeah, if it's an accusation, I didn't do that, right? You know, uh, or reviled back. I mean, that's kind of what I want to do all the time. So uh, that's in, and that's not Jesus. So the reviling uh, is, uh, and this word is, it's a present participle, which means it was a continued reviling. As we know, Jesus was not just accused once or twice, but, you know, when he was arrested, brought before the chief priest, they accused him of, uh, you know, saying he's going to tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. They accused him of saying he was God uh, to the chief priest, and the chief priest takes him to Pilate. They start accusing him all over again, the same things. You know, he's claiming to be a king. You know, Pilate, you need to do something about it. Taking the hair, they did the same thing. They're reviling him and continue uh, insulting him. And all during that time, <clears throat> did he revile back? Not at all, not at all. Um, Matthew 26, 53. Um, Do you not think that I can appeal to the Father? Uh, and he has once sent one, uh, 12 legions of angels. When, that's what makes his not reviling so impressive is because at his disposal was legions of angels. And if you recall back in the Hezekiah days, one angel destroyed 185,000 Assyrians. So you can imagine the power behind 12 legions of angels. But anyway, that's the power that he had uh, at his disposal. Uh, disposal, I guess, not disposal, but disposal. <laughs> um, so he did not revile in return, even though he had the capability and the power that he could do what he wanted to do. And when he suffered, <clears throat> he did not threaten. Um, he, when we suffer, sometimes you know we would want to threatened back. I mean, that's just kind of our again nature. But what did he do? He said, Father, forgive them. He didn't threaten them. He didn't say something to them like, you know, you're going to get what you deserve for doing this to me. You know, uh, no, he said, Father, forgive them for they know what they do. And, he, and the reason he did that is because he was totally committed to the Father's will. He was totally committed to, to God's purpose. And, and he did that. He did that right up until the end. You know, he said at the very end there, um, into your hands I commit my spirit. And after he said this, he breathed his last. His commitment, his underlying um, uh, strength was to do the Father's will, his underlying desire to do the Father's will. As he had told his disciples in John 4, it goes, that's my food. My food is to do the will of, my, of him who sent me and to accomplish his will, to accomplish the work done. So he did not threaten in return. And, he, and, and so Jesus' response to unjust suffering um, is our perfect example, perfect example to be like him. So when persecution occurs, we should do exactly what Jesus did, keep entrusting ourselves to God and his perfect purposes. Uh, it's not us. So, and that is because suffering is temporary, but the reward is eternal, Right? Um, you know, Romans 8 tells us, Paul tells us in Romans 8 this, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed. It's not even worth comparing it. It's not, you know, you don't, it's, it's ridiculous to even think of it because the sufferings would be so short term, glory would be forever and for eternal. Now, while you're going through these sufferings, it doesn't seem like that, but that's why we have to keep looking ahead to the eternal reward. Um, and Paul says also in 2 Corinthians 4.17, this light momentary affliction. And, he suffered, and Paul went through a lot of light momentary afflictions uh, with the beatings and everything he went through. But he described them as light and momentary. Again, it's preparing for us the eternal weight of glory. Again, beyond all comparison. You can't even compare this suffering that may be taking place for us here. And it may last our lifetime here. But eternity is forever, for eternity. So it's not even worth comparing the two. Because things here on earth are transient, okay, but glory, uh, but the unseen things, glory and God, are eternal. So we can't even compare the suffering here. So we look forward to God. We look, we look to God's will and God's purposes, even in unjust suffering, 
um, especially that suffering we go through because of him. But Jesus didn't just come to be the example for us here. Okay, that's not his purpose for coming. His purpose for coming was to be to save us. It was to be our atonement, was to die for us, was to save those that are his, right? Verse 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So Peter now gives us the primary purpose for Christ's ministry, for Christ's appearing. It's a substitutionary, atoning death uh, for all that would ever believe. And that's of supreme importance. That's, that's the main, that's his purpose for coming as well. Yes, he was an example in his ministry and how he lived his life and what he taught was all truth. And we should follow it and follow his examples. But his purpose for coming was to save those that are his. Um, because we, as a sinner, have a debt to God that we can't pay. Okay, it's uh, nothing we can do. We are without hope except for Jesus. And so Jesus paid that debt. He was the substitute for us. He took our sins um, over 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it really good. It says, for, for our sake he made him sin, speaking of Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's that his robes for mine, which I think we're singing today, right? It's on there, okay. So he, he gives us his righteousness. He bears our sins. He bears our sins. And I like the way Peter says it here. He, he starts off verse 24. He says, he himself. Okay, that's kind of a double, a double like I myself did it. You know, you, you think about that. John MacArthur calls that an emphatic personalization. Okay, think about that. But the idea is, he's saying this, that, uh, and the King James translated, who his own self bore our sins, okay? Uh, but it stresses that, that he did it himself voluntarily, without coercion. Um, he sacrificed his life as the only sufficient sacrifice for the sins of all those who would believe. So it, it, is, it is himself that did it. He himself did that. And the word bore means to carry a load. He, he took, again, he... He gave us his robe of righteousness. He put our sins, a big heavy robe, uh, robe on him, and he suffered the wrath of God against those sins. So he bore or carried our load all the way to the cross. And it's also uh, worth pointing out, he says, our sins, okay? He himself bore our sins. And I kind of highlighted our, our there because who's he writing this letter to? He's writing it to believers, right, to Christians, all right? So he, that's his audience, and, and that's who he's talking about. So, so he's speaking of our sin, all of those that, who would ever believe, okay, our sin, believer's sins, okay? And, and our sins makes that specific to the elect. He carried our sins to the cross. Uh, the, and it's the same thing that the angel in Matthew 121 uh, told uh, Joseph. He goes, she will bear a son, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Again, it's a specific uh, atonement that he makes for the sins of all his people. And, and, and the, Peter's re readers would understand this substitutionary atonement very well because they would be familiar with the sacrificial system and the, uh, the sacrifice of a, a life for the sins that you have committed, uh, a life to uh, forgive your sins, a life to atone for the sins you committed. So it would be, it would be understandable to them quite well, as it is to us, that, that instead of doing that every year or every so often, killing a lamb or goat or whatever for your sins, um, Jesus was once and for all. So the, the priest didn't have to go every year make atonement for sins. You know, Jesus did it once for all. So they would understand that, that substitutionary uh, atonement, that substitutionary sacrifice. And then he goes on to say, we might die to sin and then live to righteousness. So he bore our sins on that cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. As you well know, that word might die, which I wrote down there in uh, Greek, is a uh, hapex legomenon, right? You all know that, right? That's what that one times means there. It's used one time in the, uh, in the New Testament or in the Bible. And, and the only reason I bring that up is because it's not the normal word for die. 
Okay, it has some little different connotations that, that kind of that apply here, and it means uh, really to be absent or missing or uh, to really cease to exist. Okay, so when you when you put that in the penalty of sin, then that Jesus took has been taken away. It's missing. Uh, it's ceasing to exist anymore. Um, it has been nailed to the cross. It's been taken as far as the east is from the west. That's the whole idea there. It's taken completely away, taken completely away. And we're no longer dominated by that sin's power in our life. So now we are able to live the righteousness. And Peter, I mean, uh, and Paul kind of explains it further, the same thing in Romans 6. He it, it does it in a little more detail, but just a, an excerpt from 6, so kind of bring it to light again. In Romans 6, uh, Paul says this, so we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. Again, cease to exist, that same kind of idea. Uh, but again, he's talking about our old self, okay, it dies, it's crucified. Um, so that we will no longer be enslaved to that sin. That sin is taken away as far as the east is from the west. For the one who has died um, has been set free from that sin. So our, our, the one, our old self, has died. We haven't physically died. Our old self has died. So we have been set free from that sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe we'll also live with him. So we're died to sin. That sin has been taken away. Now we can live to him. And we know in verse 9 there, it says, We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. So death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. One time. But the life he lives, he lives to God, living to righteousness for God. And so in verse 11, he says, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin. Okay, you have died to sin. It no longer exists in you. You're no longer, it's been taken away. Okay, but you're alive to God in Christ Jesus. And the only way we can be that is because of the death uh, of his son bearing our sins takes our sin away. Now we are free to live to righteousness. So that's the idea there that, we, that, uh, that he has taken our sins away. Now we're free to live to righteousness. And so then he goes on, by his wounds you are healed. Okay, amen. So by, again, he, he bars from Isaiah there, 53. He says, Isaiah 53, verse 5, I'll read that. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions, our sins, our he was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement or the punishment that brought us peace. It brought us the peace between us and God now. He suffered the punishment, so now we can be at peace with God, and with his wounds we are healed. So Isaiah is obviously talking about spiritual healing here. Okay? It's not, the focus is not on physical healing here. Although Christ's atoning work in future heavens and earth will take care of that, okay? But it's a spiritual type healing there. Um, physical healing will take place, um, but that will be in the new heaven and the new earth. Um, now, just to be fair, and I got a few minutes uh, at the top of your uh, last page here, it says, you know, Matthew, however, uses this verse a little bit differently. And he seems to relate Isaiah's prophecy to physical healing. Okay, so let me just, and, it, and it's relating it to his, his ministry that he did. So I'll just read to you Matthew 8, 16 and 17. It says, says that evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. Verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. So some can misrepresent this verse as well as uh, by his wounds you are healed to, to say that um, Christ's atonement, um, that we can claim physical healing because of Christ's atoning sacrifice. Well, Christians still get sick. Christians still die. Christians still sin, okay? Christ's atonement really covered all that, but that is something yet future. Okay, we, um, that is something that the, the full manifestation of him will be in the new heavens and the new earth. So uh, really kind of a, a better way of maybe understanding Matthew's there and Jesus' healing ministry is like with all the miracles Jesus did, 
they validated who he was. They demonstrated he was who he said he was. They validated his teaching and everything. And so, so this was a, really a manifestation. He was teaching people that this is what it's going to be like in the kingdom. Um, physical healing, though, again, everybody still dies, right? Everybody and Christians get sick and Christians still die. So, so claiming that uh, as we talked about in, in the Tuesday night Bible study, the faith healers kind of distort that, um, that passage uh, by saying that, that if, if they're, they think they've granted the power of healing, but they can't heal you unless you have enough faith. And so if you don't have enough faith, you don't get healed. So that's, that's kind of their out on that. But that's, that's their distortion of, of these verses. We, we know from experience that Christians... Good Christians do get sick and, and do die, so we, uh, we can't claim that for, uh, as, a, as part of the atonement of physical healing. So not only he, is he um, uh, our atonement, okay, but he concludes this section by saying he's also our shepherd. Verse 25, he says, For you were strained like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. So Peter once more reminds us who we once were and who we are now and what Christ has done for us, right? One more uh, just understanding that he gives us. Uh, and again, this comes from Isaiah as well. Isaiah 53, now verse 6, he says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Again, the Lord has laid our sin upon Jesus. Um, so we've all gone astray, though. And the analogy to being a shepherd um, and the sheep is, is all throughout Scripture. We see that a lot. You know, Psalm 23, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, and, uh, and Ezekiel is there. But uh, we know that Jesus described himself as the good shepherd, right? And in chapter 10, he did it many times. Uh, he's a good shepherd. Good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Uh, I know my own and my own know me, know me. I love that verse, uh, how, speci how specific it is as a shepherd and a sheep, the description is given to us. But we need to understand also we're the sheep in this analogy. <laughs> and uh, I didn't mean to write that word stupid down there because I know you're teaching your kids not to say that word stupid. But sheep are, are relatively dumb. Uh, they're, um, one of the things they do is they get easily disoriented and they wander. Uh, if they get outside, if they're not in their normal environment that they're used to, they'll keep wandering the wrong way. And not only that, they, they're really indiscriminate about what they eat and drink. You know, they, they need to be shown what to eat and drink because otherwise they'll drink stagnant water or something that'll kill them. Uh, they'll eat things that are poisonous to them. They, they don't have much smarts uh, from that standpoint. Um, plus, with their big woolly thing, if they get in fast-moving water, you know, if they wander into a stream or something that's fast-moving, they could easily be swept away. And that may be what Psalm 23, when, is, when David's asking, lead me beside still waters, he says, not rushing away. But we're sheep, we're, that's it. And, we're, and sheep are, are totally defenseless. They have no defense mechanism except to run and I don't think they run very fast so that's not good and they're they're really pretty filthy their 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 wool has it, it gets uh, it's got lanolin in it so it attracts every little piece of dirt that's in there and that's why they need to be regularly sheared and clean uh, it's really a health hazard to them as well uh, so as a shepherd what does a shepherd need to do Shepherd needs to feed them, needs to defend them, needs to watch over them, needs to bring them back, um, needs to clean them. Uh, a shepherd has a lot to do for the sheep. Um, that's probably why Jesus said there in Matthew 9, he says when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. They were wandering. So Peter tells us we were straying like sheep, um, in our natural, unregenerate condition, that's what we do. We stray. We wander. We, uh, we're in darkness. We don't know which way to go. We're, we're alienated from the rest of the herd. Um, 
We're under the dominion of the God of this world, Satan, and, 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 and as Paul tells us in Ephesians, we're, we're spiritually dead. That's strained like sheep. But he says, then you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So that, that shep- returning to the shepherd and overseer of souls kind of indicates a, a repentance, a turning away from, from how you were to how you are now. Uh, and that repentance can only come about uh, with the shepherd drawing you uh, with the Holy Spirit. Um, but it, 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 uh, it has a connotation of repentance, like the prodigal son. You know, he went away from his, he wandered away, <laughs> and then he came back from his former life in a form of repentance to the Father. Um, now, the shepherd and overseer, it also in the Bible it refers to pastors and elders and their responsibilities. Um, Peter says later in chapter 5, just to kind of put everything in perspective, uh, this is his, um, uh, his telling the elders what they should do. Uh, they should shepherd the flock of God that is among you, uh, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, willingly, as God would have you, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Okay. And when the chief shepherd appears, okay, so the chief shepherd is, God, is Jesus. When he returns, he's the chief shepherd. Pastors and elders, a shepherd of flock, and are examples to the flock. The flock is examples to everybody in the world, right? Uh, as an example of Jesus. So the example just kind of keeps going down, an example. But the chief shepherd is what he really has in view here in uh, verse 25, um, because only he can be the overseer of your souls. Only he can save you. And it's only by he and his atoning work that we talked about earlier can save your souls. And, um, but as believers, he's our perfect example. Perfect example. And so we strive always... Um, by the strength of the Spirit, to become more and more like Him, to sanctify ourselves like Him. And by doing so, we demonstrate our Lord and Savior to an unbelieving world. So that is our charge today, to be examples of Him in an unbelieving world. All right, let's pray, and then we'll have a little time of fellowship. Father, again, we thank You so much for this time. We thank You for Your Word. We pray that you will give us strength through your spirit to be that example, that you will not let sin uh, domineer over us, but that your spirit will guide us in everything we do. Give us that strength even when we're unjustly accused or we're persecuted for you to continue to be the example that you were while you walked this earth. Lord, we thank you so much for your saving sacrifice that you have given us. Uh, In your son's name we pray. Amen.